Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Hope you're doing well out there in sunny California. Is the sun even up over there yet? No, not yet. We still got about an hour before the sun even peeks its head out. <laughs> wow. The sun is out in Tennessee, my friend. It is cold, though. Yeah, it's the unseasonable weather with a little bit of rain right now for us. Yeah. Um, I am joined this morning by Bill Frost. And here in just a moment, I'm going to read his impressive bio. But before I do, I'll tell you where you can pick up his new book. I think it just dropped this month, didn't it? Yes, it did. Just a few days ago. Outstanding. Um, I want to talk to you first about the American Warrior Society. If you are uh, thinking about doing something to, to be proactive in this strange times we're living in, Bill, I don't know how they're, <laughs> I don't know a more delicate way to say it, but I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Very strange times. I keep telling my kids, I'm like, yeah, this is not normal guys. This, this is what we're living in right now is, is not the way it's been for my 54 years on this planet. But uh, if you want to find out if becoming a member of our self-preservation society is the right decision for you and your family, Click the link on today's show notes. Take a 14-day free test drive with me and Mr. Mike Seeklander. We have everything from white belt to blue belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu. We've got Dr. Dan Olesnicki, a SWAT doc, teaching you tactical medicine. We've got Mr. Mike Janich teaching edge weapons. Christian Dare of Clinch MMA. <clears throat> John John Machado, black belt. As well as Jason Kelly, American top team, teaching some amazing grappling and wrestling. Um, so we've got everything from unarmed combatives to less lethal vehicle tactics, you name it. It's in the training vault. Please take a free test drive today. Uh, we got Gerald Dees is on from Oregon. He's coin number 952. Will Rhodes is off Missouri. He is American Warrior Society coin number 2269. John Shriver from Yukon, Oklahoma. Doug, good morning, Doug. Is out there in Columbus, Ohio. He has coin number 78, a very early adopter and a lieutenant with a major department up there. <clears throat> Guy is on from the Philippines. Good morning. I will go ahead and read uh, Bill's oppressive bio if I can find where I stuck it at. That's the beauty of live TV, Bill. Yes, it is. <laughs> you think you're ready and then, well, maybe you're not. Yeah, being a PIO for many years, I discovered when the cameras go on, everything likes to turn itself off. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. So true. <clears throat> Bill Frost started his career at 19 year old reserve officer. He rose through the ranks to captain with his last assignment being acting chief of police before suffering an injury that led to his medical retirement in 2023. William is the recipient of the United States Coast Guard's Meritorious Public Service Award. The Sausalito, am I saying that correctly? You got it. Sausalito Police Department's Blue Star and Life Saving Medals, the Marion County Police Officers Award for Heroic Action, and several other awards and commendations. He is the graduate of the FBI's National Academy and holds an Associates of Science degree in Administration of Justice, a Bachelor's degree in Vocational Education, and a Master's degree in Criminal Justice, specializing in law enforcement management and terrorism slash homeland security. In addition to his work on leadership, William authored an article on leadership for the Police Executive Research Forum's January, February 2020, <clears throat> excuse me, 2012 newsletter and instructed at the FBI's Rocky Mountain Command College and the 2023 International Association of Chiefs of Police Conference. William is now the managing consultant owner of Code 33 Consulting, LLC, a law enforcement public safety consulting firm. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you today? I'm doing better than I deserve. <laughs> you know, um, I, I'm, I'm really excited about having this conversation today. <clears throat> I wrote an article for the Gazette when I was still on active duty as a Marine Corps officer about uh, ethical decision making and, and leadership. <clears throat> and uh, it's still being used at the University of Florida and the University of Michigan's uh, ROTC program to teach leadership and decision making. Uh, so I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. We're going to, what we're going to do is Bill has just wrote a book. Bill, tell us about your book, sir. Well, the book is Leadership and Law Enforcement, 10 Key Traits and What Law Enforcement Agencies Could Do to Install These in Future Leaders. When I was going through my educational programs and when I was preparing myself for future advancement in my department, I discovered that law enforcement really didn't have any really good leadership books. You had a ton of management books. You had a ton of administration books, but none of those actually kind of helped you prepare to lead men and women in action. Um, and also they talked about absurd, 
absurd concepts that were just for the checking the boxes. What is span of control? What is your effective communication rate? Or a bunch of these terms. But when it comes to where the rubber meets the road, those aren't going to help you influence, impact, and motivate your people. So as I was reading and preparing, I ran across an author, Ed, uh, Edgar Pruer, who wrote numerous books about leadership for military. And he focused on the three-star and the four-star commands. And he would pick their brains about what are the leadership traits and commonalities that everybody needs and get their philosophies and then put those down. So I figured nobody did it for law enforcement. Let me try to do this. And as I dug deeper, I was able to contact some great law enforcement leaders from departments of all sizes and throughout the United States and discovered there are common commonalities. There are common traits that all leaders need to have at different times to be effective. And us as a profession are not truly installing these or helping develop these. So I thought by writing these down, preparing creating the book and putting it out there, not for my own good and making any money or anything like that, but to help the profession. And as I was doing it, I got a lot of good feedback and I said, well, let me push it out there and see what happens. And I've got continually get good feedback. People have said it's worthwhile and useful. And I just want to make, do my little part to keep on uh, helping out the guys and girls in uniform because I, well, I physically can't do the job anymore. I still want him to have an influence. I still want to be a benefit to the men and women of law enforcement. Beautiful. Absolutely. Love it. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> I've got Johnny King on from Kentucky. My beautiful bride, Miss Lisa, is on. Uh, Chris says, bravo Zulu, Bill. <clears throat> uh, Stephen says, Billy is a fantastic police leader. Looking forward to hearing what he has to share. Sarah is on. So good morning. It's chilly up there on the shores of Lake Superior. I can only imagine. <laughs> Dr. T.C. Fuller is in the house. He is Nash National Academy 269. And I, don't, I think he may have been a, a proctor or a, in that class. He, he was know. a proctor for my, uh, my class. That's where I ran into the good doctor. Ah. Well, you hear that? Uh, Doug says, I love it up there. Plan on visiting the falls. Alan Kelly, a retired Virginia state trooper, is on from occupied Virginia. <laughs> <clears throat> My brother Jeff is on. Thank you to the 20 folks watching us live. Please like and hit that share button. We're just getting going. What Bill does at the beginning of the book, and I actually uh, copy and pasted this in here, he defines what you define what you consider uh, law enforcement leadership. Okay. And I'm going to read it real quick. So we have a, a starting ground from which to talk about the 10 traits that you discuss, Bill. You say it's a person's ability to inspire another individual or a community in order to obtain their willing compliance and assistance in the accomplishment of a goal or objective, even if the goal or objective is unpopular to the individual or community. Um, why did you settle on that definition of leadership, Bill? Well, it's, as I was looking, I was looking more for an academic concept of leadership, but also a, a, a definition with that would make people realize that leadership isn't always popular. And in order to be effective, sometimes you have to do things that you personally may not like, but it's still for the good of the organization or for the community. There are all things in our life that we may personally disagree with or we don't like for one reason or the other. But as long as they're not unlawful, illegal, or unethical, we still have a duty to do them. Um, and also, when you're looking, a lot of people will say leadership to the community. What is that? A, what is that a law enforcement concern? What's well, a major law enforcement concern? Because we're not only leaders for our organization, we're leaders for the community. Community members will come to us. They will ask our opinions. And it's up to us not to just give the company line, but to tr say the truth, what we feel as public safety leaders. And, and you can never lie to these individuals for your own people or for the community. You have to tell them the truth. And sometimes that may, you never want to get into political battles with individuals, but you want to say, hey, you know what? The decriminalization of drugs is horrible for society. It creates nothing but quality of life problems. And you walk down the streets, you're jumping over a bunch of homeless individuals that are high that are blocking our pathway or the little bit of crime, the crimes that occur from that, the petty thefts, the shoplifting, the muggings, all these are things that people don't want to hear, but they have to hear. As well as when you're talking to your folks at the department, you may have a good young officer or a middle age officer, or even an older officer that have been doing things one way for a long time. 
and they've never been told, hey, you're doing something wrong or the way you're acting is causing issues, not only for yourself, but for the other, for the rest of the department, you need to improve. You have to have that strength to be able to tell people these unpopular things and things that people don't want to hear. Okay, let's, I love that. I agree with that. <clears throat> Before we go any further, we've defined leadership. Let's define what is law enforcement in 20, 21st century America. What is the purpose of law enforcement, Bill? Well, it looks like it's changing every single day. And it, people are trying to find that definition, but it always goes back to the basics. It's to provide public safety and keep the community safe and to protect our citizens. And how do we do that? Well, it is learning what your community is all about, finding out what's the worries, what's the concerns, and what are the problems, and then focusing your resources and focusing your people on keeping your community safe. Every organization is different. Every community is different, just like every state is different. We have to identify what are our problems and then focus our resources. And the only way to actually keep people safe is be doing is doing proactive law enforcement, encouraging our officers to get on the street, making contacts, arresting people when necessary, or doing the informal uh, counseling sessions of, hey, I catch you one more time doing this minor offense, you're gonna get hammered, do you understand that? Police should never be used as a social experiment we should never be utilized as a, I always like to say the military should never be used as a nation building outfit. Well, the law enforcement should never be used as an outfit to push agendas, to push social agenda change, or to manage social concerns such as homelessness or other projects or other uh, issues such as that. Our job is to ensure the safety of everyone in our community and also to be that line that says, this is right, this is wrong. You go into the wrong area, there are repercussions and consequences, but you have to treat everybody the same, but we have to be a neutral party in keeping everybody safe. Oh, I don't like that layout, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Bill. <clears throat> uh, so I've had a little, I'm a former police officer myself. Of course, I didn't dedicate my life to it like you did. Uh, but I have stuck my toe in it for a few years. And of course, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of amazing law enforcement officers as a trainer uh, over the last decade or so. The idea of keeping people safe as a law enforcement is a... I don't know if I would push back on that per se, because I think the Supreme Court has been very clear that police have no duty to protect you. Uh, there's several rulings that show that G Gonzalez leaps to mind, and there's a few others. You may be more aware of that than I am. And I think to me, <clears throat> it's basically enforcement of the law, period, without passion or prejudice, and to do so in a, in a moral manner that is beyond reproach. Um, so this, I, because we can't be everywhere as police officers. And right. I think to, to, to let, to even say that, like <clears throat> if it was up to Rich Brown, I could, I was King for a day, I would have removed the sticker protect and serve because I think it it's uh it's great for marketing, but it's not necessarily why, why I'm here, uh, why I wear a shield in the community. Do I want to keep everyone safe? Absolutely. Can I be everywhere? No, I can't. So how do you manage competing priorities? I mean, is it like a priority of life thing uh, I just want to be clear before we get into the leadership and law enforcement, like, I think there's a misconception and you, you alluded to that at the very beginning, Bill, you know, you're like, Hey, it, it really kind of, it, it's changing. I think you said that. And you also said it, it, every community has different needs and maybe their needs for enforcement might be different. Can you unpack any of that for me? Yeah. It, kind of going back to right in the beginning, we don't have the responsibility to keep, keep an individual safe. Our job is to keep the community safe. Mm -hmm. And that's the big things. And it is, you got to look in every community has different issues. They have different crime problems. They have different uh, outside impacts that are, that impact and influence that community. So the officers have to know what are those. I mean, being an agency that my former agency was right next door to San Francisco, that mm -hmm. Golden Gate, we were the border patrol for San Francisco. So every lunatic that walked through that location, every the huge homeless influx, they came through our city. 
where our city did not want to have all those petty crimes or all those quality of life issues that keep on coming that are associated with that. So we they wanted our agency to be proactive in contacting individuals that are acting suspicious. They wanted our agency to be proactive in the hunt for cr petty crimes and the hunt for criminals. While other organizations are saying, take a seat back, we don't want officers to be proactive. So you have to know what is going on. We have to know what is the highlights. I mean, there's some cities that look at certain crimes and say, this is, yes, we know we have crime occurring. Perfect. Example is many cities in this nation have prostitution issues. Mm -hmm. They may not be on the street prostitutes. They could be the, I call it the high class prostitutes that are in houses or in massage parlors that are continuing to operate. Well, you look, there's no crime associated, no outside crime associated with that. You're not having robberies. You're not having a drug usage around those houses. You're not having the quality of life issues in those areas. So some departments go, you know what, we're going to focus our resources in another location. Other cities that are having the prostitute problems on the street, well, you have to deal with that because you have drug usage. You have human trafficking occurring. You have... Uh, robberies, you have the traffic issues with girls and guys walking into the street to solicit. So they have to focus their efforts there. So you got to know what are the priorities and what your community wants to dig into. And like everything, everybody has a small amount of resources and a small amount of manpower to be able to do work. So you have to realize what are the issues you have to address. And part of the leadership problem that is, is when you have to tell your upper governmental controls to say, hey, you know what, we understand this is occurring here. That's not a problem for our community. We will address it if it becomes one. This is where the issues are. And if they're trying to push you to do something that law enforcement should not be engaged in, that's when you have to put your foot down and say, hey, that's not a police's job right there. So uh, since you brought up the issue of uh, San Francisco and being, you know, one of the, uh, the gateway to that area, what has been some of the impacts of some of the policies uh, of the last few years um, with regard to that area? Well, I hate to say it almost becomes say there are no consequences. I could do anything I want. Mm -hmm. And when you allow people to believe that way, they're going to be, just become more brazen. They're going to become mm -hmm. more emboldened and they're going to try to continue their activities in other locations, thinking if I could get away with it here, if it's not a big de deal here, then let's let's keep on trying it every other city let's keep on keep on moving let's keep on moving and guess what you know what well one city may not like it the other city will say no we were not going to deal with that so as you get those rulings that are coming down and those efforts you have a population of people that think that the rules don't apply to them and law enforcement has to then get in there and say yes they do but also when you start seeing law enforcement officers and agencies having their hand cuffed, hands cuffed and having their hands tied behind their back, you take away their motivation, you take away their morale to do anything. And once you do that, then you have officers that want to become firemen and sit in the station until a call comes in. And you can't have that. So you have to find a way of keeping your officers motivated, even during these horrible times. Yeah, and um, lots of great comments coming in. I'll just try to get to a few of them here. Uh, it, it, I think that Alan Kelly says, you know, uh, speaks exactly what you were saying, Bill. Since Virginia, they've introduced laws that are definitely tying the hands of law enforcement from doing their jobs effectively. Yeah, uh, I think that slide has been going on for probably 30 years, but it seems to be accelerating. Uh, Johnny King says, I believe that the, the belief of police being able to keep people safe has a large influence on people not taking their safety and protection as a main priority. Chris says, mass alum present. <laughs> Uh, Jeff says, how about dealing with individuals suffering mental health issues after ending those facilities? Do you have any, uh, what was your interaction with those and especially over the course of your long career? Uh, well, mental health has always been an issue in this nation going back to the 1970s when they started closing down institutions for one reason or the other. And a lot of times one political party or the other gets blamed for closing down the institutions while both parties took 
had responsibilities in doing the closing for one reason or the other. Uh, I would say that there are a lot of people on the streets that have mental health issues. Not every single individual out there does have one, and they all have two differing severities. I've seen people that were just bat crap crazy, but they were not so crazy that um, you had the ability to remove them and put them into a location to test their uh, welfare and to see if there's safety for themselves or others. I've seen people with light mental problems that are just paranoid and think the world's following them. I had one guy who believed that the, all the cats in the neighborhood were staring at him and it was his job to run away from them. And it was like, okay, you know what? You're not going to hurt yourself or others, but you're not, you're all out there. Um, so they're out there and our responsibility as law enforcement is when we contact them is to evaluate them to determine are they a danger to themselves or they're a danger to others. And if they're not um, a danger to themselves or others, well, if they need some assistance, well, maybe we can aim them in the right direction to get some assistance, but it's not our responsibility to force it upon them. Um, there are a lot of people that are on the streets that are actually out there on their own. They want to be out there. And uh, I would have conversations with these people. Well, why are you out here? Well, I like being in the outdoors. I like living in public. I like being uh, with nature. And you're, mm -hmm. going, you're living in a cardboard box. No, this is what I prefer to do. Right. Um, and it's like it's not up to me to force them out as long as they're not causing a problem for the rest of the community or public safety. Uh, what we do when we've seen some of these horrible uh, decisions that have come out lately, Boise versus uh, Idaho, um, some of the other, the Ninth Circuit, the clowns up in that area that are keep on passing or striking down laws or creating rulings that are tying law enforcement's hands. Well, now all of a sudden you have people camping out on the streets. You have people camping out in the front of businesses. You have people uh, using drugs in public. You have encampments showing up all over the place and tying the hands of law enforcement who have once were able to go in there, deal with the issue, deal with the issue properly, where we're saying, you can't be here. I'm not going to harass you. I'm going to hold you accountable. Mm -hmm. And let's move around. Or you've had officers that made deals with these populations and say, okay, you know what, here's the rules. If you go in this area, you don't cause any problems, you don't generate any cause for service, we will not go and we will not be a thorn in your side. We will let you kind of, we'll have a let and let live policy where as long as you're not violating laws or making anything unsafe, we'll give you, this is your sanctuary. This is mm -hmm. our little DMZ right here. But if you Go, if you cross over this boundary, if you go into these areas, if you start causing problems, we're going to come down on you like the force of God. Yeah. People understand that. Now you have officers have their hands tied where it's like, well, you, you told this person to move. He's laying in the middle of the sidewalk. People are jumping over him to get into their business. Well, they can't. No, no, they could camp anywhere they want. Then no, they should not be able to. There has to be some controls. No, I absolutely agree with you. Looks like Mr. Mike Seeklander's on. He says the cats stare at me sometimes too. <laughs> uh, good morning, Mr. Mike. Uh, good to have you, sir. Uh, Will Parker says, Mike, they are sizing you up to determine if they can take you. Uh, Doug says, unfortunately, the sixth district that includes Ohio has become as bad as the ninth. In fact, since 2007, the sixth circuit has been overturned by the Supreme Court more than the ninth. Wow. Yeah, that's something, something. right there. Yeah. Um, Okay, I think that preamble sets a, sets a good stage here for the rest of the conversation. I want to talk about the very first thing on in your book. You talk about selflessness. Perhaps uh, as is this is there a reason why you put that as number one? Actually, it is. Uh, when I got promoted to sergeant, uh, my chief at the time, man, I have the most tremendous respect for, looked at me and said, "Remember, it's no longer about you. It's about what you could do for others." And he goes, you understand that. I could tell that from your, the way you go out, go out and you deal with people, how you deal with your subordinates, but always remember that. And then later when he promoted to be the lieutenant, he says, now it's really not about you. To be a leader is to be selfless. It's to take a piece of yourself and give it to the people that you serve, uh, be it your people that you have the honor of guiding and leading in your own department, as well as the community members that look towards you as the person who is there to help protect the community. Um, 
you have to make those sacrifices. You have to put yourself second. You have to do what's good for them. You have to do what's good for the organization. You have to do what's good for the community. You have all your ambitions, all your personal desires for grandeur or for advancement or for the things that are going to benefit you, you have to push those to the side because you have to be the individual who is the conduit for your folks' needs and desires and wants. And you have to put yourself there for them at the same time representing the organization to them and being the conduit to put yourself uh, as the individual to make things happen and sometimes sacrifice a little bit of your own um, desires or your own uh, philosophies on some things. Um, because our main thing is to take care of the people that we're entrusted to, is to make sure our officers are properly trained, make sure our officers are properly motivated and given the best working environment as possible. I would love to say our 100 our percent, our job is to keep our officers safe 100% of the time. It's impossible to say that. It's, we, could, we could do everything we can to give them the best possibility to be safe 100% of the time. But we can never guarantee that they come home safe. That's mm -hmm. something like, say, you, that's anytime you put on the vest, you take the chance. I remember uh, the first vest I put on in 1996 as a 19-year-old reserve on the trauma plate. It said, this way towards bullet. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, that kind of really wakes it up. Um, but also, we when I say it's selfless too, it also means we have to take time and take, sometimes that cuts into our own time of things we need to get done at work or even personal time. And we have to be there to take every opportunity to help educate and train our officers to be the best they can be. And also to help them get through some of the little stumbling blocks that everybody has in their career, be it they screwed up on a call or their personal life may be a little bit of a mess and it's drifting into their work life. So you have to be there to kind of say, Hey, you know what? We're all officers at one time and we got to be here. I remember uh, a lot of the old dogs when I first started, they always said the three B's will get you into trouble, bills, booze, and broads. Mm -hmm. So be careful, watch out for them. And over time that those have adapted, it's not politically correct to say that anymore. But as a good leader, you are looking out and you're saying, well, this officer is kind of going off a little bit on the rails. Let me pull him back in a little bit. And hey, learn from my mistakes. Use yourself as an example of, hey, you know what? I screwed up. This is what happened. Eat a little humble pie. And that's being selfless, too, because you're, you're sharing from your own weaknesses. No, good stuff, Bill. <clears throat> you know, uh, you were in the Army, correct? I know that you're in the National Guard, right? No, my father was. Oh, your father was. Okay. I, uh, yeah. Okay. So in the Marine Corps, and I, I believe it's probably a military wide, there's a, you know, what is leadership? It's mission accomplishment, number one, and troop welfare, number two. And I think selflessness, I think someone could easily hear what you have just said there with regard to selflessness and go, okay, well, selflessness relative to your people, right? And of course, that that's exactly what we're talking about, you know, the, the troop welfare but it's also selflessness to the mission, correct? Correct. That's the organizational mission, because that's why that's why you've been entrusted to lead these Marines, this soccer club, this whatever it is, is to accomplish the organizational goal, whether that's to win the championship or to keep the citizens of uh, City X safe. So I, am I wrong in saying there's a part of selflessness that goes toward the organizational no, you're 100% right, because being a leader is you're self-sacrificing yourself to do what's necessary for the organization. And on the organization to be successful, you have to have goals, you have to have a mission, and you have to be all driving towards the same common uh, accomplishment. This is what you want. This is your shining city on the hill. This is what you want to get to. And part of being a leader is sacrificing yourself to help that occur and being selfless, and that's giving more of your time, focusing your energies, uh, sacrificing a little bit of other, you might have other things going on. You have to be keep on driving. Uh, the old rule is mission first, men always, and that always goes in. In order to accomplish 
your mission, you have to have the following of your people. By being the selfless leader, you're going to earn that and you're going to get people to follow you better, which is going to accomplish the goal. But being, you're being selfless towards the organization as well because you're helping accomplish that goal um, while making some sacrifices. And it's all about sacrifice. I mean, leadership is about weighing and balancing and putting yourself second in the mm -hmm. organization. I told this to people when I retired. I said, you hear a lot of retirees say, I owe nothing to this organization. Well, hold on for a second. This organization gave you the position that you were in. This organization gave you opportunities. You don't have to love the organization, but you do owe things to this organization. I said, I owe so much of my career to this organization. I, what I am because of this organization. I was born because of this organization. My my father was my uncle's sergeant, and at that wedding, he met my mother. I My uh, father and the police chief were in a horrific argument the day I was born. When the secretary came in and told my dad to leave because my wife, my mother was in labor, the chief looked at him and said, hey, get out of here. That conversation never continued on. Mm -hmm. I got hired by this department. Also, I then later on, I met my wife through this department. This department gave me my education. This department gave me all these opportunities. I had to take advantage to them, but the organization gave them to me. So I have the organization I owe a lot to. So we always have to remember that we serve the organization as well as the people. And there's a reason why in this, we are in these positions that's to push both forward. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I, I um, got to be honest, man, I don't always see that. And let me, let me explain what I mean by that. When I see uh, in a lot of communities where patrol is only at 60 percent staff, yet all the staff billets are at 100 percent. You know, you got this big top heavy Leviathan and uh, CID is full and the people that make TikToks are full and all this silliness. And yet patrol is. You know, these guys are working 100 plus hours every single week getting all this overtime and they're just burned out. If it was up to Rich Brown, I'd be like, hey, man, we're pushing everybody to the field and we're going to get this taken care of. And then I'm going to have a comprehensive plan to do recruiting and get the numbers up where you guys aren't having to do this. And then we can pull back and refill a lot of those staff billets. But uh, but but and that's my point, I guess, to selflessness relative to the organization. And to me, that's also good troop welfare. We're not burning out the guys that are interfacing every single day with the community. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember as a captain, I would still fill in for patrol when necessary. Mm -hmm. If we you know what, we don't need to bring a sergeant in for overtime or I would work my normal 10 to 12 admin hour day and then hang out and help the patrol team at night for several hours because they were short staffed. And a lot of times I would tell the, a lot, many times the person in charge of the team that day was an officer in charge. They didn't have rank, but they had experience and they had, um, they had been trained to be uh, the babysitter for the department. And I would look at them and I'd say, hey, you know what? You're trained to be the temporary supervisor. You're going to still be the supervisor. I'm here to assist you if you need anything. But I'm not taking over calls. I'm not pulling the captain's bars and saying, hey, I'm in charge here. It's, this is your shift. I'm here to help. Something goes absolutely crazy. Well, that's a different thing, but yeah. I'm here to assist. And you got to be willing to get back into patrol. You got to be willing to help. You got to be willing to look and say, okay, what are needed now? Um, my department, we had a very small staff and we only had so many resources. So everybody had to be available to work at all times. And you look, um, I remember reading once and I mentioned it in my book that as people progress up the ranks in law enforcement, you stop seeing a lot of those people as cops because they stop wearing their uniform. And also a lot of even line officers, they start stop looking at your command staff as cops because they never are in uniform anymore. You go to the fire side and those fire guys are always in uniform. The fire chief, the battalion chiefs, the division chiefs, all their ranks. And they show up to fire scenes and they put on all their turnouts. They dress up like they're going to run into the building. They never leave the command post. I mean, right. they, don't, they don't even smell smoke. <laughs> but they're in their uniform. They're still part of the brotherhood. Like we, For some reason, unless it's uniform day, we throw our uniforms into the closet and we only put on when necessary. Yeah, um, I don't like that. I don't either. I, <laughs> I try don't to be like in that. uniform as much as possible. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, 
that probably cut my career short a little bit because with my back wearing all that gear all the time mm -hmm. made things you know, break and break apart and deteriorate and all those other things. Mm -hmm. But you have to be in uniform because you're, you're no matter what rank you are, you're still a cop and yep. you got to show that to people. Yeah, I love that. I absolutely 100% agree with you on that. So let's talk about mentorship. Number two, what do you mean by that, Bill? Well, I've noticed, and I had a uh, police commissioner, Ramsey, actually told me this in his philosophy, is mentorship is something that in law enforcement, we just do not very do very well. We get caught up in the day in and day out activities, and we forget to help the next generation along. We forget to go in and we don't make it a priority to kind of start preparing our people. Um, and it's taken that time to do it. And law enforcement, as we're preparing people for the future, too often we rely just on tests and we're not in, it's just, be, in, we're selecting leaders by chance, not by choice. So we need to start taking the time to help guiding people as they move their way through the careers. Not everybody wants or needs to be or is capable of being a police chief or a lieutenant or a captain or even a sergeant. But we need to do everything we can as leaders to help people get the most out of their abilities. And part of that is taking the time, having conversations with your people. And this is where the sergeant's role is the key of any organization. The sergeant is the backbone. Yep. because they represent the organization to the troops, mm -hmm. but also represent the troops to the organization. They have the hands-on uh, touch with everybody every day. So they are able to interface with their officers every day and take the opportunity to say, hey, you know what, why don't we think about this? Or let's do this, or here's a project. Let me, I'll guide you along the way. And you've got to continue that philosophy of helping, preparing, mentoring, and I always like to say training your own replacement at every rank you go to, you have to have that ability. And too often we put that aside because we get caught up in the, we got to do this today. I got a staff report. I got to do this. And people always think as you move upstairs, you have more free time because you're not answering the radio calls. So you have the ability to do more of this. Well, in reality, you have so many other things being thrown at you. You don't always have the time. So you have to make sure you schedule yourself so you do have the time. I remember when I had people come into my office and say, hey, you know what, could, uh, could we talk about something? At that second, everything drops. Computer turns off, project books get closed, project files get pushed aside, sit down, phones go unanswered. Um, it's You give them your 100% attention because you want those people, those sergeants that are coming to you, to give the same thing to those officers when their officers come to them with questions. But it's also making yourself available and doing the on-the-spot mentorship, where you're just walking around the department, you're checking in with your patrol team, you're bumping into people in the hallway. Hey, how's it going? What's happening? Okay, tell me what's going? On. Is everything okay? What can we do better? Tell me about. Hey, what's that last call? Oh, great! Did, did you think about this? So, just on-the-spot leadership, mentorship, and you can't be a mentor and be doing things that are opposite of what you're saying. So you have to 100% check yourself and allow their your conversations with your uh, officers and with the members of your department to help check yourself as well. I Yeah, great stuff. And that a lot of what you're saying is relative to mentorship, Bill. Uh, so going back to mission accomplishment, troop welfare, right? Tro troop welfare, often people misunderstand that as, well, we're having hot dog day here. We're doing family night or we're doing all this other superfluous stuff, with the, which is nice. I mean, they all have a place. But troop welfare also means getting them the best body armor available. It also means getting them the best tools to do their job, to make sure they have the best equipment, the best training, the best leadership possible. And uh, I think a lot of times people think that, well, mentorship means that I'm going to teach them teach them how to play softball no relative to the job and the mission what are we doing and i love something else that <clears throat> and that is when somebody walks into my office everything else just gets taken off the calendar it, it's nothing matters right now but me and this person in front of me this uh, because think about it from their position and i know you do because that's why you're doing what you're doing but i want people to hear what you just said bill when people comes into their boss's office they've been agonizing about honey should i go should i should I talk to, 
you know, Captain Frost, you know, and they're asking their peers, man, I need to go talk to him. You know, I, this is a problem. They don't do this willy nilly. Just will pop into your office and say, you got a minute, boss. Uh, and I think we need to respect the fact that there's a problem, man. And uh, if there's one person feeling that way, there might be a dozen behind that person, right? Yep. Because, you know, for the one person that comes up to talk or the one person that grabs you as you're walking towards the car or you're going to grab a cup of coffee, hey, Cap, can I talk to you for a second? They've had conversations with at least their own patrol team. There could be there could be 20 people that they've talked to and they've had, everybody's having somewhat of the same feelings. Yes. So you got to make sure that you're there for them. So when you do talk to them, they could come back and say, you know what? The organization cares. The, this is what the captain did. This is what he did. But you're not just not just what the captain did or what the lieutenant did mm -hmm. is that by your actions and making that one person that you're talking to feel like you're hearing them truly, they get them back to say, you know what? This organization cares. You may not give them the exact answer they want. I mean, they may say, hey, we need this. We need this. And you're going, I totally understand. We can do our best, but we can't afford this. Or, you know what? Yes, it would be great for us to have a bear cat. We do not need a bear cat. We don't have a SWAT team. We haven't had a barricaded subject in 20 years. Right. No, but I, this is what we can do. Tell me, let's, this is what we have. And come up, let's come up with some ideas about what you guys think we truly need that we're not seeing. Mm -hmm. But also part of the mentorship is exposing people to different parts of law enforcement they may never think about. Um, and I bring like equipment, making sure people get the best equipment. Well, part of that is I, I while I was very, I knew I managed the program regarding buying equipment or buying firearms and buying different things like that. I didn't, I wasn't the range master, so I didn't know the best rifle to get. So I would, when I would finance stuff, I would make sure I talked to my firearms folks and say, what is the best rifles we could get? Okay, perfect. For fleet management. Okay, you know what? We want the best cars. I know what I like, but what does the department want? Find out what do you guys like, let me know, and then we can budget the numbers and then expose, this is why we do this, is showing them the job and showing them the, that part of law enforcement. Exposing them to different parts of the job they may never know. You have a person who spent his entire career in patrol they have no idea about how investigations work. They take a call and they take an initial report about a fraud or some kind of financial crime or even a sexual assault. Well, then we'll have this officer run with the investigation for a while to expose them to that and have the detective as well as yourself as their supervisor continue to mentor and help them to teach them about that. Part of our job is to always make things better for them and give them every opportunity we can. No, oh, I love it. I absolutely love it, Bill. Uh, let's talk about uh, education. You talk about formal and informal education. Uh, and I think that's number three or number four on your list. What do you mean by that? Well, education is essential to be successful in law enforcement these days. But anytime anybody says education, they only think about the degrees that get hung on the wall or the little certificates or in the colleges you go to. When in reality, education is everything. It is all your experiences, all your training classes, all your time on the street, and in addition to your formal education that makes an individual well-rounded and better to, able to deal with the dynamic situations that we have in law enforcement today. Um, the proper education is key. And as we're looking at, we want people to go and try to further their formal education, because not only does that open doors for them later on in their career, it could also open doors for them later on as they retire and go to private sector or do other things, but it also has them interfacing with individuals that are in different lifestyles than they are, different decision-making processes than they are. Cops hang out with cops often. Yeah. Just like the military, mm -hmm. army hangs out with army, marines hang out with marines. You're part of the brotherhood, you, you hang with your brotherhood. In order to know what's going on in this world, you have to have a wider vision and you have to have a wider perspective. So you have to get opened up to different philosophies. So that's what good formal education does. It helps you see, you might not always agree with them. In most cases, we may go, this is a bunch of crap, but you're hearing the different perspectives. Also formal education, a lot of times, People get into the law enforcement profession not expecting you have to do a lot of paperwork or write. And have, most of our job is doing paperwork and writing. 
education, formal education helps us get develop better writing skills, makes us be able to communicate better. Um, so that's where the formal education helps us. The informal education is what are you doing to advance your knowledge about your profession and about the world around you? And people push off the informal stuff all the time. Um, the best way of informal education, as you can see behind me, I love books. Reading is one of the greatest ways to develop yourself and obtain an informal education and enhance your knowledge because you're learning from the experiences of others. And I always tell people, what, what should I read? Well, you want to focus on biographies, autobiographies, memoirs, history. Um, and why? Because they talk about situations. They talk about thinking processes. They think they tell you about dynamics that you may never consider. And yes, you may never be confronted with the exact situation regarding what you just read about, but you will be confronted with things that are similar in nature. And by because you have read and studied and prepared yourself professionally, you will have a basis of decision making so that you're going, I'm confronted with a similar situation. OK, I remember in the back of your mind, it starts kicking in going, OK, well, when this person was confronted with this situation, they kind of did this. So let me tailor make my pro plan to deal with that. Um, part of informal education also is the training act. Go into conferences, go into conventions, reading periodicals, uh, watching, watching podcasts such as this, mm -hmm. learning and educating yourself on all the different dynamics and all the different venues that are out there. Um, because unfortunately, law enforcement is, we are a the crisis of the moment profession. We deal with what's in front of us and we go to the next thing that's in front of us and we go one by one. And it seems like every 20 years, we forget about everything the previous generation learned and right. we forget our history. Um, and that's why we have the same scandals and we say have the same use of force abuses and we have the same uh, IA investigations every 20 years, be it Rampart or Memphis, be it the Buddy Boys in New York or the drug murders in Miami in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, it is mistakes that happen. They repeat themselves over and over again. And by, without us studying and what this is what happened, this is what people did last time. Um, you go back and I just see my buddy, uh, Chris, uh, he was Coast Guard. We worked a Marine Patrol unit together. Uh, we worked very tightly. He always says, you don't fall back on your training. You, you fail to the level of training you received. Mm -hmm. And you got to make sure you do that. You got to make sure you're prepared and ready to go. Um, and as we're looking, as you have to educate yourselves because we all don't know everything. And then when people come to you and go, what's your plan? You're recreating the wheel again. We don't study people. There's so many leaders from the past we can learn from. August Vollmer, Louis Valentine, Daryl Gates. We need to look at these individuals. We need to learn from them and adapt them. They may not always be, have been 100%. They might have been wrong in many ideas. You have to look at them and use their examples. I mean, what the New York Police Department did in the 1990s throughout the 2000s, up until about 2000. 16, when all the social unrest started happening and some policies started being rolling back that was instituted by Bill Bratton, John Timoney. Um, those are proactive law enforcement officers. The, that program of ComStat and proactive law enforcement, you could take into any size department, modify for your organization and push out and you'll be successful because it's focusing on that, but you need to know how to do it. And that's where education comes in. No, I love it. Uh, and on that piece, you know, you talked about reading history, reading memoir, reading biography. I absolutely love that. And 100% agreement with that. And if it was again, rich Brown's King for a day, I would create a cabinet level position for a historian. And it would be, you know, someone that we can turn to and go, Hey, Jim, is, is there a historical precedent for something like this? They go, actually, in 1937, blah, 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 blah. And the, the variables are relatively close. And these are the, some of the outcomes we can expect if we go down this course of action. Oh, okay, because you're right. We're so quick to like not look in the rearview mirror and go, how did it 
how did it become what it became? Oh, well, there was some things going along the road that are predictive of where we're heading. Uh, and, and it's, and uh, Dr. Fuller says, memoir, Rich, didn't you write a memoir? Yes, I did. And click on the links today and you can buy your uh, on violence and varietals. Uh, but I love that. And it also goes back. It, it's a beautiful segue to our next leadership thing. And that is decision making, because we're taking that education. We're taking the things that we've learned and we're making good decisions with it. Correct? Yes. And Here's the key thing about the education. You obtain all that information from formal and informal sources and then all your experiences, and you use that to guide yourself in making decisions. Um, and you, you have all that great background, but then you also have that little voice in the back of your head saying, well, maybe you should do this. Well, that's all your life experiences. That's everything you've been through. Those, that's your guide. And when you're confronted with decisions, you got to make them. And that's the biggest weakness we have in decision making in law enforcement is when officers or command staff are confronted with decisions, they're not making it as necessary. And they're not making it when they need to make it. They hem and haw. Yes. They, worry, they worry about what might happen. They don't want to look. optics. Exactly. They don't want to look bad or they don't want, if I do this, what's going to happen? Well, you know what? Sometimes the right decision will look bad to a certain group. It will look good to another group. Sometimes the right decision is not popular. Um, you have to have that intestinal fortitude to go, the decision needs to be made. It doesn't, decisions don't always have to be made on the spot. Sometimes you need a little, let's hold back for a second. Yeah. Let's do a little studying. But when a decision has to be made like that, mm -hmm. you got to have those people that are willing to do it. And mm -hmm. sometimes that's a learned trait. Some, sometimes that's just internal. A person is a quick decision maker. Mm -hmm. um, not only do decisions have to be quick, they have to be good, but I rather have somebody make a decision. Mm -hmm. And if it's a bad decision, we could fix it. But mm -hmm. at least your bad decision is getting the ball rolling and things are working. A good, if you make no decision, nothing happens. Yeah. And that is our, we got to be there. We got to be making quick decisions. We got to be, and we have to make the right decisions. But that's all part of listening, knowing what's going on, surveying the area, and being somebody who has studied the profession and know, studying what's going on in society today. Yeah, let's unpack some of that because in your book, you do a really good job right out of the gate of, of you know, you talk about the January 6th response and the the chief who was in charge of the United States Capitol Police. And it's a really compelling story, and I encourage everyone to read Bill's book, if not for, if not for anything more than that, because <clears throat> it speaks to a lot of what you're saying right now. You know, he's trying to get people to take action because, uh, as you talk about in the book, He's he's got a law that restricts his ability to, to do certain things, which no other chief has this yeah. problem. And I'll, I'll let the book explain that indecision is a decision a decision to postpone action or not take action is a decision. So I think people that that are labeled indecisive, oh, they're decisive. All right. They're decisive in doing nothing to help the problem. Um, and, and they may be concerned with optics or how, you know, how is this going to make me look higher? How is this going to make me look to lower? Is this it, I, uh, because of the Marine Corps, you know, the Marine Corps is very clear that their leaders need to have what they call a bias for action. Take action. And you'll hear, you know, great is the enemy of good. I'd rather have a good decision violently executed right now than to have a perfect one tomorrow. It does me no good. Everybody's sitting there watching. Uh, and I would rather be, you know, accused of, you know, man, <laughs> I, I've always said this, Phil, like, you want a decision to make, come to me. I got no problem making it, right? Yeah. And I've worked for some commanders that were fantastic in this regard. They would bring the command group together and they would go around the horn, you know, the room and say, uh, you know, Rich, what do you think? Dave, what do you think? Sergeant Major, what do you think? And then he'd be like, Any, anything else? He'd put his hand above the desk. Anybody else? Guys, here's what we're going to do. You know, I'm like, oh, and in his plan, you might hear elements of what you said. You might hear elements of what the Sergeant Major said. It may go completely contrary to what you wanted. But once he slapped the table, we all jumped up and in lockstep at speaking with one voice. Uh, what do you think about that? Oh, right, that's great, because there are certain decisions that have to be made just like that. And you have to be the person that makes them. You don't have time to get all that information. However, every whenever you can make a decision and get to other people's feedback, you want to do that. 
because everybody brings different information. They do bring different perspectives. They, they approach things from a different viewpoint. And also they have different experiences through their careers, their personal lives, their training that you might not have. So they bring all these things in. And as a good leader, you listen to them and then you incorporate them in your plan. But when it comes time to make a decision, it's you. You have to be that decision maker. You have to be responsible. There were certain times in my career that I felt people were hemming and hawing and above me. And I finally got to a point, I said, okay, command decision, we're gonna do this. And later on, I got my butt handed to me because I'd made a decision and it was like, well, why did you do this? Something had to be done. Well, we were thinking about doing something else. Something needed to be done. If you yeah. want to slap me, slap me. Amen. Um, and then as a field sergeant, you'd have to make these calls, but I would always want to empower my officers to make the decisions. And sometimes I saw analysis paralysis by analysis. Yeah. They would just be thinking too much or they'd be trying to talk too much or trying to think, doing everything but taking the action. A perfect mm -hmm. example, we were dealing with a mentally disturbed person once and she was all over the place yelling and screaming. She started running around in circles in the middle of the street. And I'm sitting there looking at my officer who's questioning her. Well, did that upset you? Did that cause you trouble? And I'm going, she's running down the middle of the stream, screaming at streets, screaming at cars, jumping in and out of traffic, grab her, right. let's do something. But he went through the process of overthinking it. Mm -hmm. Then I worked for a chief once whose famous line was, I need a defendable position. And she mm. would say, they would say that on every single time a decision had to be made. I need a defendable position. And it was like, well, for a second, sometimes you just need to act. And this defendable position is this was the right thing to do by the yeah. law, by everything. This is right. It might not be popular. It might not be something that you read about in one of your chief magazines or at one of your conferences, or it might not be the most kumbaya way of doing it, but it was the legal way of doing it. It was the right way of doing it. And we had to deal with it. And they just, I need a defendable position. They were so afraid that a decision they made might get them fired as an at-will employee that they needed to have piles of justification for it afterwards. And you're going, sorry, um, understood because that leader didn't have much of an operational background and uh, they always wanted to have all the backing and everything. They needed to make sure that they had backup before a decision's made. But when it, you can't do that. You have to act and do what's right for the moment. And you know what? If it was a mistake, we could fix it. Yep. But you have to have people willing to make decisions. And unfortunately, in today's society, people don't want to make decisions. People don't want to be the ones that make that call too often because they don't want to be shamed for making a decision that may be counter to another group's thought process. Well, it's not just shamed. I mean, in today's climate, you can spend the rest of your life in prison. You can lose okay. everything. Yeah. Um, which you know wasn't always the case but it certainly is now especially with qualified immunity being flushed down the toilet and i thought a lot of it is a misunderstanding of what is and is not qualified exactly. immunity. of course i don't necessarily want to go down that rabbit hole because it will <laughs> it will suck up the rest of the we could do about three weeks of shows on that oh my god yes we could um and i think this uh, i think we're flowing beautifully right into the next thing and that's the strength to challenge you know, that's the next thing on your leadership list. Tell me about that. Well, not everybody is always correct in everything they do. And, and also, you got to be willing to say the king has no clothes on at times. Um, why you need to hear these perspectives, because not every you, you don't think of everything at all times. So you'd be dealing with something and you're, you're pushing what you think is going to be right. And somebody else is going, oh, I see an issue here. I have to bring it up. And you have to have the ability to go to your bosses and say, hey, boss, I hear what you're doing, but here's my perspective. Or, you know what, this I need to give you my two cents. Um, because it, if you don't do that, the chief may continue pushing on, the sergeant may continue pushing on, and they're going in the wrong direction and they never know that. Or it's just the, they're saying things that are just wrong. Mm -hmm. And you're going, hey, things have to be fixed. Or... It, but there comes a time in which as long as you give that information to your boss, this is how I feel, This is this, I don't agree with this, as long as what they're doing is legal, as long as they're doing is ethical, as long as they're doing is moral, once they make that final decision, 
you go along with the program, you salute, you say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, you accomplish the mission. If it's neither of those things, you could say, I want that order in writing and I'm taking this up to the next level. Uh-huh. But when it very few, that's 0.0002% of the time. Yeah. Most of the time, it's what they're doing is right. You just don't like it. You don't agree with it. So it's still up to you to bring out your opinion and bring out your full or professional opinion and doing it in such a fashion that they'll listen to it. Um, that's the key. People sometimes bitch to bitch and they lose good value. Yeah, there's so many things I want to unpack here, Bill. One of the things that was rattling around in my head when you're talking about decision making and things of this nature is, and I don't mean to go backward, but there's an excellent book on battlefield leadership. Matter of fact, I think that is the name of it by Captain von Schnell. And he was a German officer during World War I who immigrated to the United States. And he went to work at the Marine Corps basic school where they trained young, young officers. And one of the things he talks about is the way they would train their lieutenants prior to World War I in the German army was they would walk them across this field and they're presenting them with a tactical problem as they're walking. Okay, this is what's happening now. This is what's happening now. And the further you got in, the more information you got. But at some point it was an intellectual trap because you're now dead. You know, you have a perfect picture of the battlefield, but it's too late, right? Your unit's been wiped out. So you have to make, uh, you have to make a good enough decision with the available information and be, and not be afraid to be fired. So many times I have literally said, Hey, fire my effing ass. You know, this is what we're doing. And, uh, and you have to be willing to do that. And if you're not, then you don't deserve to be a leader. You have to be willing to stick your neck out. And in my book, I talk about instances where I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Well, Officer Brown, you know, no, I do understand. I will not do that. And the next thing you know, I hear the, the helo, the chief is flying in. Why is one of my sword officers, you know, defying an order? And then I, I sit down at the typewriter, four pages later, here you go. This is why. And they're like, oh, my God go back to work. And then yeah. the corporal and sergeant, everybody else's heads are rolling because this is an immoral, unethical order. I have zero duty to, to, to be abided by it. And like you said, I think that was kind of your point, right? Bill, like, Hey, put that order in writing brother. And we'll me and you and that piece of paper that you're trying to get me to do. We'll, we'll happily trot our asses right on up the command uh, flagpole. Yeah, but I, exactly. I, it takes moral courage to do that though. Doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And you have to have the ability to do it. And you have to also pick and choose your battles sometimes. If right. they all of a sudden admin comes back and says, you know what, I want you guys wearing blue so- blue socks tomorrow. And everybody's going, no, we always were worn black. Well, do you want to go to war about what color socks you're wearing? No, that's ridiculous. But when there's issues, and I, unfortunately, we've seen people sometimes do things like that. Mm-hmm. But also as a person who has got the strength to challenge and the person who's willing to come out and say, hey, we got it. Let me talk to you about this. It's mm-hmm. how you approach the person. You go up to the command staff yelling and screaming and acting like a buffoon. Right. They're always going to listen to you. They're going to say, you know what? Okay. That is what you you've lost your audience. You've lost your ability to make a point. If mm-hmm. you go to them and say, hey, this is the issue I have. This is what we got. This is my perspective. Mm-hmm. you're going to get people to listen to more. I mean, you do the other way. You got your command staff looking at the person and going, is this guy insane? Or this girl, there's something wrong with this girl. Yeah. It's how you approach the people, what your battles you're picking and winning. I mean, in my book, I use an example of the strength of challenge in 1965 during the Watts riots, uh, Daryl Gates was an inspector at the time. And he's leading his people through block by block, clearing snipers from the rooftops, settling the unrest. And the chief at the time was uh, Bill Parker. And he pops up on the radio and he starts screaming orders and do this, do this. And it's contrary to what at the time Inspector Gates is saying. So basically Gates just turns off his radio and tells Mm -hmm. his people, turn off your radio. And he's in his book, he actually says he apologized to the chief. As he's turning off the radio, he's going, sorry, chief. He clicked it off. But he had to do that. He had to challenge. That was his strength to challenge the situation. And he did. So when situations are confronted and it's things are wrong, it's your duty to speak out. Um, and then as long as it's not illegal, unethical, or moral, once mm-hmm. the final decision is made, you push forward. If it's any of those things, you go, we go in a different, op- we're, this, we're going a different route here. But you got to have the ability to speak the truth to the power. I absolutely love it. And I want to speak to something here. And in, in the paper that I wrote 
uh, once again, that's being used in the NRTC programs at a couple of universities. I talk about this, and that is we need to develop leaders that can function when the radios are off. Uh, because, you know, you can't always go to hire and get the answer. I mean, anybody that's been in the military for a, a day and a half, you know that comm's going to go down, right? Uh, it, as a police officer, my radios always worked. So I'm not saying that, but what I will say is in an austere environment, Sometimes radios don't work. I need to know how to execute without being able to, to run to the, the CO and get orders. But I also like the fact that, you know, you also have to have the courage to turn the damn radio off yourself. Yep. You, you don't see the same battle space that I see. You don't have a, you know, I understand you're making decisions, but you're making decisions with an incomplete picture of what's going on. So right now I understand your intent. I'm going to shut this off. I'm going to get things done. I love that story. I'd never heard that before. I never discovered it. I read in this book years ago and I'm going, you know what, this is something that it, boots on the ground have always the best perspective Correct. and you got to push forward and you got to have the guts. Daryl Gates was a chief for his time. If he put that same, his same philosophies and stuff in today's world, he would have a lot of trouble, but he was smart enough to be able to adapt his style. He would be successful today using a different philosophy. But he had the guts to be able to say, we're we're going to do it this way and I'm challenging. And we need to have leaders that have that guts to be able to tell elected officials, sorry, I hear what you're saying, but no. We have to have the, the um, leaders to be able to tell their city managers or their town managers, I understand what you're doing, but no, this is my professional opinion. If you're going to say we're moving forward, well, that's another way. But you need that strength from you don't develop that strength as your top leaders unless you had that strength imparted to you and developed as part of your agency's culture as you were moving up. Mm -hmm. And you need to have your own people be able to say that to you. Yeah. And, and that's one good thing I will say about the Marine Corps for all my complaints after 23 years in the organization. They do develop strong, aggressive leaders. Um, and. 99% of the time, if I made a bold move, you know, I felt that my command had my back. I, I will not say that for the two agencies I worked for uh, in law enforcement. Uh, I, I felt more often than not, not more often than not, I, I think I would almost fair to say every single time, you know, I, I understand the organization's mission. I understand the intent. I understand where the chief and the city manager is going. I understand officer safety. And yet, you know, you make decisions in this like, every decision's question, whether it's why'd you write the, the finance manager's uh, nephew at citation Saturday. I'm like, uh, he's going 27 miles over the speed limit. Yeah. Did you know he was, I, I didn't know who he was and I don't yeah. care. You know, it's law enforcement brother. If you don't like it, tear the ticket. I, I care less. I'm not emotionally involved in this decision. I'm here to enforce the law procedural correctness in the application of unquestionable moral authority. That's what I'm doing. Yep. And, and that's, I was lucky in my career. I only had one leader. I felt that never had our backs a hundred percent of the time. And that was that I need a defendable position. Um, mm -hmm. And it is what it is. I mean, you fire, I learned more from that bad leader about than I did it from any good leader. Cause I learned about what never, to, what not to do. Amen. And in some ways I, that's what helped me propel as I go through. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have that strength. You need to have officers below you making those decisions and not being afraid to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And Sometimes you have to go back and look at them and determine, okay, what is an organization that we want to impart and mm -hmm. learn from this? And yeah, the decision might have been wrong, but what can we learn from it? But if you don't have people making decisions and they have to come to you for everything, then you've selected the wrong person to be in those lower leadership positions. Amen. Well, and I think it speaks to uh, my good friend Michael's point. He says most organizations do not select for, a, for or tolerate leaders. They want functionaries or managers. What say you to that point? In, in some ways, I agree 100%. Uh, some organizations just want people to follow the company line. Um, and some people just want to be able to make, we want to keep the ball rolling no matter what. You need to have promote for leaders and you have to listen to them. And you have to select the best people for the best job. A lot, and we go down, we could go down a rabbit hole with that, uh, especially in today's world about who should get selected for what position and what criteria. Very it always falls to the best person. I don't care any of the other factors. It's the best person for that position. You want them to be leaders. You want them to make decisions. You want them to be based on the organization's goals and stuff. 
Yeah. But you want to encourage them to give those feedback to tell. You also want those individuals to go, you know what, when their top leadership comes to them and say, okay, you made these to calls. I understand why you made them, but in the future, you need to do this. Those lower leaders have to listen and understand that as well. Uh, but if you don't have if you don't have individuals on the field embracing their leadership positions and making those calls and doing it with the good for the best of their officers, the best of the department, and the best of the community, they have failed leadership. Yeah, I agree. Um, and that kind of goes into the strength. So we talked about the strength, the challenge. Let's talk about the next one: embraces change. Uh, and you're saying that a good leader embraces change. Unpack that for me, sir. Yeah, well, the thing is, they will always say the two organizations that hate the most hate change the most in anything is law enforcement and the military. We've been mm -hmm. doing the things we've been doing forever, and we know we're comfortable in it. We have we've been doing the same procedures, the same policies, the same tactics. We get used to it. This is the way I've always handled it. This is the way I've always done it. You feel comfort in that. But organ just like societies and just like time changes everything, law enforcement changes as well. Um, and as law enforcement changes, you have to be looking and embracing the good, you have to embrace the good changes and you have to push those forward. Bad change, you know, and when you're making these changes and you're looking at changes, it's always going to be what's the best for my people, what's best for the organization, what's best for my community, what's best for the profession. You don't change for change's sake. You change for property, for proper means and methods and make things better. Uh, but a lot of times people do not want to break out of their comfort zone. I've done this for mm -hmm. 20 years. I'm going to continue to do it 20 for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't anymore because of different case law or we got different technology or we're doing a different approach. Um, and you have to kind of get people to listen because part of change is acknowledging what you've been doing might have been the best thing. What you've been doing might have been wrong and let's fix things. And if you don't have somebody who's willing to listen and willing to make changes, you don't have a leader. You have somebody who's just a, a ticket puncher. Right. I'm, not, I'm not causing issues. I'm not doing this. I'm just going to follow the process. Mm -hmm. It's like being on an assembly line and being the supervisor for the IBM assembly line as they're going through and chip in place, chip in place, chip in place. Mm -hmm. uh, you need forward thinkers. And that's where embracing change is, encouraging people to think. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. And I think that, you know, I always try to encourage that from the bottom up, like, you know, like Lance Corporals, Corporals, Sergeants, they're seeing things that you and I don't see right uh, uh, up in our lofty tower. And as much as I tried, you know, my span uh, and I ran a leadership academy at Paris Island for years. And um, I, I could I could agree with so much of what you said this morning, but I don't want to belabor a lot of what you said stands on its own and it's incredibly well. But I want people to tell me, is can I, can I make things better for you? How? One of the things that we heard from the field was, hey, sir, if we had a GPS in our, in our government vehicle, if we had a GPS in our gov, it'd be a hell of a lot easier than doing this. Like, easy day, man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We got 830 recruiters throughout the Southeast United States. So we're going to, we're going to drop some coin to do this, but the juice was definitely worth the squeeze. But sometimes it's change for change's sake I'm not interested in. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Somebody will come up with, a, we call it the good idea fairy. The good idea fairy would come floating into the room. And I, and I often say, I'm like, what problem are we trying to solve? And if everybody kind of scratches their head, I'm like, well, then until we got a problem that's presented itself and this is the workable solution, why are we even talking about this? Exactly. Um, you know? What I mean? Yeah. Too many times people will come in and go, let's change this. Why? All right. Oh, uh, because I read about it. Well, is that an is that an issue here in the city that we're dealing with? Is this an issue in our department? Do any of our people have problems because of this? Well, no, but this is I, I saw this in a class and I want to change this. Well, no, that's not a good change. Or they wake up one day and go, I just want to do something different. Well, why are we doing that? I mean, there's got to be change is great. It's got to be good change. And it has to be with a reason and a thought out reason. It's not just because I, I want to change things because I just don't like it. Hold on. So you don't like it. You come from a different agency and you look at our agency and you don't like it. Well, why don't you like it? Um, there's so many re people don't explain themselves well when they institute change. You got to have. Yes. This is why we need. This is the change. This is why we need it. This is how we're going to do it. And this is we want to hear your feedback. Mm -hmm. And 
most of your change should be driven by what you hear from the field, from what the street officers are saying. Hey, you know what? Th our jobs would be easier if this happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just as lack of understanding or they re refuse to understand. And I, I definitely had that, you know, when we would roll out things at the command group level to the field, you know, sometimes it was a misunderstanding. Like, what, what are you trying to do? Um, and understanding the intent of what we're trying to accomplish and the problem we're trying to solve and that this might be the right solution. And if it come from, hey, you know, so this was Staff Sergeant Smith's idea and here's how he's using it in Jonesboro. And this is a really successful program. Let's let's try this so that they know it's not something you're trying to jam down their throat and it gives yeah. the, the young Marine the credit that he deserves. But I want to get to Will Parker's comment. He says, I believe one Achilles of humans today when it comes to leaders is they lack the understanding of right from wrong. <clears throat> and to his point, uh, again, this is what I talk about in my paper, that the, the people matriculating out of the 21st century universities and high schools don't necessarily have the same moral framework that perhaps we did. And sometimes for better and sometimes for worse, right? Uh, our generation wasn't perfect, right, Bill? But yeah. But at the same time, we have to let them know, and it goes back to the point about the radios being turned off. You know, uh, you have to have a good moral framework. And I think uh, General Krulak, I've talked about on the show multiple times, you know, the idea of the three block war concept yeah. on one block, you're handing out soccer balls and doing nation building and giving people blankets. Block number two, you're dividing warring factions. You got the Hutus and the Tutsis trying to kill each other, and you're just there to keep the peace. And on the third block, it's all at urban warfare and the mental and moral complexities of those environments. And then to be able to rotate in and out of them seamlessly, I think uh, really helped me coming from that environment into law enforcement. Because you do have to shift those gears. One minute you're, you know this, Bill, I mean, and everybody that's cops that are listening. One minute you're working a wreck with injured children that look like your kids and it's, it, it's emotional. And then the next year, you know, you're, you're, you're getting a cat out of a tree. I mean, that the ability to do those things is incredibly important. And it goes back to embracing change, man. And it starts from the top down. Exactly. If you have to set that uh, precedent and you have to set the example, and if you do that as top leader, other people will follow. 100%. Let's talk about the next thing. And that is presence. Tell me about that. Well, in order to be a leader, you have to be present. You have to be there. You have to be visible. You have to be with your troops. Doesn't mean you have to be in the stack doing a tactical approach. Doesn't mean that you have to be writing tickets. You have to be visible. You have to be accessible. And you have to be there to be seen as someone giving guidance and somebody who is the organ. People look at the leader and they look, especially the top leader, they're not just looking at you. They're looking, they, you represent the organization. Correct. So you have to be present. You have to be the person who exemplifies what is best about the organization. And you have to be the leader. Of, you know what? I want people to see me. I want my organization to know that I'm accessible. I want my people in my department to know that they can come up to me. I want also the people to know is when they look at me, they see the example of the, what I'm trying to show. I, I don't want, I want people to view me as the organization and what's good in the organization. And by doing that, you're setting an example for others to be the sergeants to show up to help their officers. You're setting for the officers to be there to assist each other. You're doing the, for me, I used to show that I'm part of the team, being in uniform almost every day. That's part of it. You're showing your presence. I'm still a cop. Walking down the hallway and engaging conversations with people going, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Yeah, I heard that call you had yesterday. You're showing that you care. You're showing that you're still knowing what's happening. Um, and even being having those conversations with people you may not even like. like <laughs> oh, yeah, Bob, how's everything going? Okay, okay, you know what's good? Yeah, I heard that call. But, and you're looking at this guy going, I can't stand this person. This person screwed me over when we were officers together. Or this person's got a wife and 14 beat wives and all that. You name it. Mm -hmm. But you're still there. And you're still setting an example. And when the call the call comes up and it's, hey, everybody needs help, you're showing up there to help. You're not just showing up there to, oh, look at me, I'm still here. No, you're getting your hands dirty when necessary. You're, I, you're willing to help. Yeah, I love that. And one of the things you said, I, I some one time somebody said, hey, sir, you know, I can't tell if you have a favorite in the command. And I, that was one of the greatest compliments I got because I think as leaders, we do have favorites. Yeah. 
Well, absolutely. Oh. There, there are people that I connect with that work with me and, and I, on a deep level. And there are people that I can't stand. I'd wring their freaking neck and run them out of my organization in the heartbeat if I could. Uh, and when I heard that, I'm like, man, that's the way it should be, right? Exactly. Uh, they should know? never know who you like or who you do not like. Right. Uh, I would I'd take that as a badge of honor. And I think it goes back to um, fairness. You know, oh, well. Oh, yeah. That's your next thing on the yeah. list. Let's talk about that. Well, fairness is just not a lot of times when you think fairness, well, what's one fair to one person is fair, not fair to another person. Or do you treat the hard worker the same as a slug? It's the key to fairness is holding everybody to the same standards. It's making expectations known. Um, and also it is treating people in a manner in which there's no bias. And that's the key thing. It's the a hard worker. They make a mistake. And a bad worker, they make a mistake. They may get two separate punishments, but you're looking at it through through different uh, visions. The hard worker made a mistake because he was trying to make a difference and just made just made the wrong call. The bad worker made a mistake because he was indifferent and just didn't care. So you different punishments may come down, but you're being impartial in your in later on. The great worker does something that he needs to be fired. Well, you still get rid of him. I mean, I've promoted people I did not like, and I fired people who I did like. Yeah. Um, and you got to be remove yourself for, in your personal likes or dislikes from the equation and treat people in an impartial manner and hold them to the same standards and then allow people to work under those. But always know that you're going to be that impartial bias. And it's like, like I said, Good people that I've liked come to me and I've gone, you know what, I, you, you're great. I would love to do this. And I'm thinking that in my mind, but I go, sorry, we can't do that. People that are coming to my office that I'm looking at going, I'm going to have to fumigate my office after this person leaves. <laughs> but they brought up a great point of, yes, we're going to implement that. Um, yes. So it's just holding people to the same standard. And unfortunately, in today's world, there's p no standards anywhere. I mean, mm. you have people coming out of colleges with piercings on every piece of their skin and yeah. smoking dope and going, hey, I used methamphetamine two weeks ago, but I'd like to still be an officer. Yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Sorry. But mm. you see, once you start lowering standards, you're not treating people fairly because you're not getting the best people. No, I agree with you. Um, going back to, we don't have an all volunteer force. I mean, the, the AVF, the all volunteer force came around like 1973, right. And they stopped the draft. Uh, but that's a misnomer. It's not an all volunteer force. It's an all recruited force. And general Wilson, who was the commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, he understood that. And he's trying to clean up the, the dregs that were allowed in under the draft and under some of the other programs that were existing at the time. They had this thing called the blue page. Like, so instead of the felony conviction, you can join the military and go to Vietnam. And so he's like that. I don't want that. And his slogan was, if it's just me and my driver, if I got to reduce the Marine Corps to just me and him, I'm willing to do that to clean this place up. And, and that took courage and it took a lot of pressure because, you know, Congress mandates the strength levels of the Marine Corps and, and, by, and he's getting rid of these turds and the numbers are going down. He's like, Hey, fire me if you don't like yeah. it. But, uh, one of your things, when you talk about, uh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it in the next one, when we talk about interpersonal skills. So let's maybe d dive into that one. Tell me about that. Bill. Well, the interpersonal skills is the key thing is you have to be able to communicate with people. You have to be able to talk to people and you have to be able to listen and hear people. Um, there's a difference between listening and hearing people. Listening just means that you're sitting there and you, the, what they're saying is you acknowledge that they're there and you're just shaking your head. Hearing people is actually list, truly understanding what they're trying to impart to you and showing that you under you may not agree with them 100%, but you're actually in taking what they're saying and you're treating it seriously. And I'll, you got to be able to communicate and talk to people of all different levels of the organ. You have to be able to talk to your brand new officer as easily as you talk to your four-star chief. You have to be able to talk to the dirtbag on the street as well as you talk to a grandmother in her home. You got to be able to venture through the different ways of speaking to people. Because if you aren't, if you don't have good interpersonal relationships and communication skills, you're going to fail as a leader because you're not going to be able to speak with your people. You never speak to your people or at your people. You speak with your people because their their feedback is just as important as the words that you're saying. 
So you have to know how to talk to everybody and know that every, how I talk to you is different from how I talk to my wife and how I talk to the record supervisor is different how that I have to talk to the patrol supervisor. You have to know how to impart the knowledge that you want to pass on. No, I love that. And let's, let's unpack some of this. So uh, like I said, running the leadership Academy, like the first thing we did was we put them through, there's an achieve global as a company that teaches communications and stuff. So we hired achieve global, uh, to teach balanced feedback. And that is when you're interacting with the, the command group as a senior enlisted leader, how do you <clears throat> speak to them in a way to, <clears throat> so that they can understand you better. And it kind of goes back to the point you were making earlier, Bill, when you were saying, you know, the, the guys that's yelling and all this, so that he may have a great point, but I'm, I'm turning it off, man. Cause the way you're giving it to me is not, not good. Um, so how do we communicate up and how do we communicate down? And one of the, another thing we did was we uh, put everybody through the MBTI, the Myers type typology indicating test. And then we would have them for two or three weeks, put it on your desk what are you, ISFJ, an ENTJ, a ESTJ, INTP, whatever it is, and we train them on how to communicate to that type of person because if they're a feeler, you might want to communicate differently than if they're incredibly analytical and you just give them the facts and the reason and, and they can go off, whereas a, someone who's a feeler may interpret what you're saying a different way. So I, I really think this is a underutilized skill that we probably need to spend more time on. And really it's only going to make your relationships at home better, your relationships with the community better. It's going to make you a better person all the way around. What do you think? Oh, I agree hundred percent. And I wish we had more upfront training regarding interpersonal communications earlier in a law enforcement officer's mm -hmm. career, because I found out in the beginning, I struggled with interpersonal communications mm -hmm. and I would be able to, if it's just me and you shooting the crap, well, I could do that. But later on when, uh, I'm trying to communicate with the public or I'm trying to impart some words of wisdom to the new officer. I just couldn't articulate myself in such a fashion that it wasn't coming through. It took years of just learning, being, doing the job, talking to people, uh, finding out the human nature, growing up in life to be able to do that. And I'll never forget because um, I, I entered the job when I was 19 years old. So having a brand new puppy officer talking to some talking to somebody who's a 45 year old or 50 year old who've had all this life experience or who might've been in prison or done drugs for longer than you've been alive. And you're trying to say, Hey, don't do this. It's not good. They're looking at you, you go, screw you. What do you know? Mm -hmm. But if, if you're, if you're hemming and hauling, you're not going to relate to them. Um, how I talk to a gangbanger straight out of Oakland or San Francisco is different than how I talk to the lady who got upset at her neighbor and scratched their mailbox. So right. it's different ways of imparting different ways to different people. And that's where I see a lot of officers uh, today and even in the past get in trouble is because they are straight line. This, I do this. This is how I talk to everybody. This is how I do it. Hold on for a second. Everybody is different. This is not a tactical guide where you open up and say, this is the best way to approach. You cover this, this side before you do this. This is dealing with people. And sometimes that's shut up. Okay, now let's talk. Other times it's like, hey, hey, hold on for a second. Let's, I hear you, but give me an opportunity. Everything is different. I love that. And I have, I have had very spirited conversations with the head, uh, I mean, a very high ranking federal officer. Uh, we were teaching a class, a firearms class to them. And it just so happened that we were having drinks that night. <clears throat> and uh, he was like, no, I talked to everybody the same way. I'm like, do you really? Absolutely. You know, there's no, no if, ands, or buts. And I'm like, Mata Sariva. And he shows me his hands. And I'm like, exactly. If, if I have to speak your language and I'm using that just as an example of that, everybody speaks a different language. You know, if I'm in, you know, I've been to Japan, you know, Ohio Gazamas means good morning. Yeah. You know, if I'm in the Hubbardian islands of the Scottish islands, it might be Matan Vah, Kim you have to speak people's languages, man. And that, whether that's Dale Carnegie coming out or whatever it is. But I think that is a huge, huge mistake that a lot of well-intentioned people fall into. It's like, no, I'm going to talk to them one way. And this is, it's like, no, no, yeah. I disagree with that. I hate to say communication is just like everything else in life. There's no one way of doing everything. Right. 
you got to make sure you are imparting the information you have, understanding the information you're receiving. And a lot of that is just knowing humans and knowing what makes people talk and tick. And uh, like I said, every, you communicate with different people, different ways, and you have to learn to read those signs. And that's only by going out there and dealing with people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there's, um, there's lots of training in that can get, that get you ahead of the curve. I mean, but you, you're right. It is a muscle that you have to build. Uh, Will Parker brings up, of course, officer Dean Keller lost his life because he didn't communicate properly to a man, his senior. I read the man who killed him to this day said he was right to kill him because of the disrespect. And, uh, and, and it ain't just in that case, officer Dean Keller's killer was a, a former, you know, Vietnam vet. Yeah. Uh, but it could be a gangbanger that feels oh, yeah. disrespected. It could be a soccer mom that feels disrespected. Like, uh, and that goes back to something else. When you were talking about interpersonal communication skills, the way we teach it in recruiting, like in military recruitment, is always assume value. Assume value in what the person's saying. And if you start the conversation off with that, no matter who you're talking to, I think you'll go a long way. What do you think? Oh, I agree 100%. If you're starting out the conversation with the approach that what this person is going to tell me is important, if you will acknowledge them that way. What they're saying may be in your mind, you could be going, this is utter garbage. But with how you're interacting, how you're looking at them, the questions you're asking to clarify have to be aimed at giving value to their communication. Um, it goes back to the loss of officers' lives. If you study the people that seriously injure, attempt to kill cops or kill cops, the one profile is there's no profile. They're all over the place. Yep. The one key thing, though, they did notice is that they're very uh, they are very observant and they read officers. And some of the, their lack of the ability to communicate could show their lack of command presence. They could show a lack of confidence, shows a lack of awareness. And you open by not having the ability to communicate to people and treat them honestly. They may feel disrespected. And you disrespect certain groups, you are on your way to a fight. It's like with the the Vietnam vet who killed officer uh, the officer. You know, do not you may not understand what that person's been through. You may mm -hmm. not even agree with why he may be traumatized or all these other issues. But you have to give the respect for the service he provided as well as the experiences encountered. Yeah. Dealing with a dirtbag on the street. You may not agree with why they're doing what they're doing, but they you have to acknowledge that they're a human being and they're surviving the way they're surviving. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the gang members, they they live by a code. It may not be your code. You may think it's garbage, but you don't disrespect a command a command gang member and start in front of one of his lower gang members because you're inviting a fight. Oh yeah. So you may not treat them like, hey, you know what, you're the king, but you don't speak down to them. And you never never speak down to anybody right. and never speak at people, speak with people. Well, and that goes back to something Chris said and something you said. Chris said the difference between hearing someone and listening to someone. And I think if we assume value, I won't just wonk, 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 wonk. I assume value in what you have to say. Now, it, it, you may start giving me word salad and disrespecting me, and now I'm going to take a different approach. But right out of the gate, I'm going to assume value. Let's hear what you have to say. Um, let's talk, which kind of leads into team building is your 10th uh, and final thing. Uh, talk to me about that. Well, I remember uh, many years ago, I was at a meeting, a uh, law enforcement meeting for all the agencies that have responsibility over San Francisco Bay or portions of San Francisco Bay. And the two-star commanding admiral from the Coast Guard walked in and he looked at everybody and said, you know what, I love this group right here because you're all talking to each other, you're all meeting, you're all coordinating. He goes, many years ago, I discovered the only thing I could do myself is get myself into trouble. By working together, you could find solutions. And I remember sitting there as a young sergeant going, oh, that makes a lot of sense. You have to be able to work with people and you have to be able to lead groups of people to accomplish a mission. And a good leader knows how to pull in the right people to help accomplish the task they're assigned. Be it providing good, effective patrol service for your own patrol team. Be it running a SWAT team, running a Marine patrol unit, running a drug unit. You gotta great, get the right people. And once you get the right people, you gotta build them as part of the team so they are an effective resource 
and they they feel an inner connection with the organization and with the group. Um, many years ago, uh, General Dempsey, when he was the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he was staying in my city for leave. And CID contacted me, and I was the point person to, for their local contact. Basically, the only thing I did was make sure they had some secured parking spaces, and if any bad, any kind of creeps walked by the building, we shoot them away quickly, because mm -hmm. CID had everything tight. But uh, I had worked with CID. We had everything rolling. The last day, they surprised me by letting me, giving me the opportunity to meet General Dempsey. He presented me with this coin. He, we talked a little bit about some of my responsibilities, and he said, Bill, always remember one thing. Every day it's about building teams, about reaching out to the people that could help. Because every day I'm on the line with the National Security Agency, I'm on with, with CIA, with different branches from DOD, in order to make sure we're all pulling together towards an accomplishment. Because one day I may need help from these people. And that's it. It's building those relationships and building those connections. So when a task comes your way and you have the resources to get it and you to build a team to be effective, and you make a team that they value being part of that team and working together. It's all we have to work together to be successful. When we when we try to do something solo, you're setting yourself up for failure. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I want to circle back to something you were saying earlier about uh, with regard to presence uh, and presence and that building that team. And I'll try to tie this thing together real quick. The Commandant of the Marine Corps and the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, they are constantly on the road. I mean, they are they might be in Afghanistan one week when it was going on and I was still on active duty. They might be in Iraq the next week and then they might be at a chow hall serving chow to the to the recruits at Paris Island the next week, right? <clears throat> so, and that's the way it should be. And I mean, the, when you see the guy, he's got sand on his boots still from some place Marines are forward deployed to. But it also creates a can potential create a potential problem if you make emotional decisions so the marine corps has two mandates win battles and makes make marines like the army wins the wars the marines job is to win battles and make marines so that we we can win those battles right so the commandant comes out and you got to understand he had just gotten off the plane bullets were snapping by his head one day and then next day he's uh in front of us at the marine corps recruiting command and he he said with tears well in his eyes he goes i don't give a shit about uh, recruiters right now i got marines dying you know he was very emotional and the the problem with that decision was he started pushing marines to the fight instead of uh filling those recruiting billets and guess what happened the wheels came off the bus in 2005 it was front page news on the new york times marine corps missed its mission in the first time in 20 something years right uh because you look around like Ain't nobody on recruiting duty. I mean, how is this supposed to happen? Uh, so I think we have to be careful of when you are present. Sometimes you can get kind of a Stockholm syndrome and forget the larger organizational thing yep. that you're trying to accomplish. So I, I just say that when it comes to building a team, what he should have done as a good team builder is allocate resources where they need to be. And in order to do the second thing we do, make Marines, I got to make sure my recruiters are fully staffed and have the equipment, the training and the competency and the leadership they need to make their mission so that we can go win these fights that I'm going to go to next week. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of tie that together with a personal vignette there, Bill. Well, I agree hundred percent because everybody in the organization brings value in every job in the organization, be it the Marine Corps or Mayberry Sheriff's office, mm -hmm. they have a important part of keeping that organization rolling. So you can't discount one group for the other because if you discount one group, you're going to lose something from them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, like in law enforcement, every patrol gets the glory, all the uniform. I always like to say all of everybody in blue uniforms and the tan uniforms, the, the street line officers, the sworn officers, we get so much glory. We get this. We get tons of blame as well. But everybody, when they think of law enforcement, they think we're the only thing. Mm -hmm. But you have to take a step away. And then there's the entire professional staff aspect, all the dispatchers, all the records personnel, all the community service officers. They're doing things every day. And even all the volunteers that are keeping the organization rolling, they're doing things that without them, the wheels will fall off the bus. And they play just as important role as the blue suits do. Mm -hmm. Yes, we face the danger. We handle the critical incidents. But 
without them doing what they need to do, we will fail because we will not be getting the support that we need. And we, it's, we're not, if we're not all working together towards the same mission and acknowledging the people, I, we're going to be, you're, number one, you're failing as a leader and you're setting up your organization to just be irrelevant. Um, yeah. I would talk to my sworn officers, the command sworn officers, exactly they give the same respect as I do the dispatch supervisor, as I do the record supervisor, and to every volunteer who gave their time. I mean, they're 85 years old and they're walking into an apartment to file tickets. Mm-hmm. And you're going, well, you know what? They're giving their time to help because if they don't do that, somebody else is going to have to do it. And somebody else is going to have that other person's job. You have to acknowledge them. You have to realize we're all part of the team. Some get the cool jobs, others get the non-cool jobs, but guess what? Eisenhower never had a cool job in his entire military career. He That's was great. a paper pusher. Mm-hmm. Without him, we'd all be speaking German right now. Um, exactly. You have to acknowledge the staff workers are essential to the organization, no matter what organization you are. No, that, and I think that's a perfect place to leave it. I mean, uh, I, my niece was a dispatcher for years. My brother was a cop. I come from a family of military and law enforcement folks, and there's some un, uh, unsung heroes out there that, that people just, we, we can't get it done without a man. Um, so uh, where can folks find your book, Bill? You can find my book at my website, which is www.codefreeconsulting.com. Uh, backslash order book or via Amazon. Um, it is, you have 13 key law enforcement leaders given their perspectives on these 10 traits, as well as numerous historical case studies about how these traits played vital roles during the law enforcement profession, as well as inputs for during my 27 year career and other leaders. Um, it's go. I, I've heard it's pretty good. I don't know if it is or not, but, uh, I, it's something that I want to make sure I give back to the law enforcement community. And if we don't acknowledge our past, if we don't acknowledge our history and use that to propel ourselves into the forward and prepare our leaders, we're going to be a profession that's going to lose sight and we're going to lose moral code. And we can't do that. We have to have our, we have to know where we came from to be what we are. Amen. And uh, make it easy for you today, guys. I put a link in there. It says buy Bill's book. <laughs> that make it more simple than that. Click the link and check it out. It just dropped this month. So be one of the first cool kids to pick up a copy. Uh, Dr. Fuller says it's an excellent book. Highly recommended. So that's, that's pretty high praise. I was very lucky that uh, TC, a dear friend with huge amounts of law enforcement and military experience felt it was very valuable. But as well as uh, I have endorsements from General Petraeus, Chief Sund, um, Chief Christian Tubbs of the uh, Southern Marine Fire Department, Deputy Chief Dudley from San Francisco uh, Police Department, as well as uh, retired First Sergeant Matt Eversman, former of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, who did his uh, valuable service in many conflicts throughout the uh, nation over the from the late 80s to the early 2000s. Yeah. So guys and gals out there, if you are a leader in law enforcement, if you're thinking about becoming a leader in law enforcement, you're that patrol officer with, with ambitions to climb the ladder. I highly encourage you to check out Bill's book. Uh, Bill, thank you for being on today, sir. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. All right, guys and gals out there, warrior nation. Remember the fight is coming. Be ready.